Well, a good afternoon to everyone in the, the and in Eastern time, um, a, a good afternoon and good evening to people joining us uh, from Europe and parts farther east. And a welcome to everyone, regardless of your location. I'm Jeff Rathke, president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm uh, really pleased to, uh, to welcome you all at this, at this webinar. Um, we are very uh, delighted to have with us uh, a couple of excellent guests uh, today. I want to start off with, uh, with one um, regret, and that is uh, that the State Secretary from the Defense Ministry, uh, Simcha Muller, uh, is unable to join us. Uh, she has uh, had to, um, uh, well, uh, back out at the last minute um, for, um, because of a COVID exposure, which has required her to uh, quarantine. Um, uh, that is a, a COVID exposure in, uh, in her immediate surroundings. Um, so uh, I'm sorry that she won't be able to join us, but uh, we have a great topic and great speakers uh, with us. And so we're uh, going ahead. And our topic uh, today is lessons from Afghanistan for Germany's international uh, engagement, and in particular, the future of Germany's international engagement. And in order to help us understand that uh, better, uh, I'm really pleased that we have, uh, have with us Rotary Kiesewetter, who is a member of the German Bundestag, a member of the CDU party. He is a retired uh, colonel of the Bundeswehr, and he has been a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, for, um, uh, well, since, uh, I think since 2009, since you first joined the Bundestag, if I'm not mistaken, right. Rotary. Um, and we are very, so we are very pleased to have him back uh, uh, with us. Welcome to you, Rotary. We also have with us Dr. Magdalena Kirchner. She is the country director for Jordan of the German Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation. But uh, for almost three years, from 2009 to 2021, she was leading the Friedrich Ebert Foundation's office in Afghanistan. So, uh, so she has, uh, in addition to her um, much longer uh, foreign and security policy experience, she has very recent on the ground experience in uh, Afghanistan. And uh, she has also been um, uh, with us at AICGS many times in the past. Welcome back, Magdalena. So a, a bit of housekeeping just for, uh, for everyone um, out there. We are going to use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. I'm sure you're all very familiar with it, more familiar than you'd like to be. So if you have uh, contributions to the discussion, please use the Q&A function. Um, and uh, the more succinct uh, and the more question-like your intervention is, the easier it is for me to incorporate it into our conversation as we get uh, through um, the remarks from our, our guests. So let me start, um, uh, Magdalena Kirchner, um, with, uh, with you, because Afghanistan is, in a way, the jumping off point um, for, for our discussion. Um, and in particular, um, you know, we have seen in the governing coalitions, uh, coalition agreement, they refer to the Afghanistan experience and the, uh, the importance of, of reviews and investigations of Germany's uh, engagement there. Of course, the, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan in the summer of 2021 remains uh, on uh, fresh in everyone's minds. Um, and of course, also the, the fate of the, the, the people of Afghanistan um, who now face uh, an extremely uncertain future uh, under, under Taliban control um, is, uh, is close to everyone's uh, minds. So um, if, if we could start by talking perhaps um, a little bit about, uh, uh, about Afghanistan. And what I'd like to begin by asking you is, does the crisis that we're currently experiencing, and that is uh, Russia's attempt to restructure uh, the Euro-Atlantic security order, does that render the Afghanistan experience um, irrelevant in, uh, in Germany's uh, security policy terms? Mm, well, first of all, thank you uh, so much Jeff, uh, for having me and for AICGS for setting up this event. It's also great to see Roderich again. It's been also a while. Um, I think uh, we have to understand this really as parallel uh, processes. Um, the Russia crisis or the Ukraine crisis um, has been in place uh, since 2014 at least, and has, on the on the contrary, also overshadowed a bit the the uh, the engagement in Afghanistan because it was 
often the question, why are we still engaged in Afghanistan, which we entered in a time where we didn't fear uh, anything in the East. And now we have to shift resources um, back to Europe where it is important. I think that was, um, there was certainly something that had an impact on Afghanistan. I think now this is even stronger, but I think what's more affected, and we're probably gonna talk about this even more, are the other out of area um, missions, I would call it, our engagement, uh, obviously, in the Sahel and Mali. Uh, I just, uh, we talked about it briefly, uh, the mandate for Iraq, Jordan, that's also going to be discussed in the next, uh, in the next weeks. And there you do feel an, an impact from the Afghanistan crisis the way it ended, I think that has certainly also a psychological impact on the foreign policy establishment, if I can call it like this. But also the question, do we have to reorient, reshift towards uh, the East, towards Europe? And are these missions uh, in, the, in the South, are they doomed to fail anyway? And are they more complicated? So I think it is parallel in a way, but uh, I think the engagement in Europe is only strengthened by it. And as you say, of course, we're going to, I'm sure we're going to talk about the, the European um, uh, and transatlantic security situation uh, in the course of the next uh, 60 minutes. But, but let's uh, stay with Afghanistan for a moment, where, uh, where as, uh, as I mentioned, you have um, you know, quite uh, uh, you know, close experience. Uh, so if you try to draw some, uh, some lessons or a couple of principles um, from the international and the German engagement in Afghanistan, and how you apply those to the future. What, uh, what comes to your mind um, is, uh, because as you say, there is a psychological effect, but there's also a security effect. Um, where, where do you uh, see this experience leading, uh, leading Germany? I mean, I think we will hear from these committees that are about to set up and uh, there will be a lot of lessons learned. Um, my concern is a bit with lessons learned is if you're not sure that you will do decisions different in a similar situation in the future, um, what are actually the lessons that we can learn? I think the problem that we had in Afghanistan is, I would say, the lack of a common goal, certainly after revenge or fighting Al-Qaeda in the first years of the war, um, on behalf of the alliance, and also on behalf of Germany, which uh, I would say, and there was also the impression on the ground, um, had parallel or secondary aims that were quite important, like being um, able to operate together with NATO states, uh, being able to symbolize or project uh, solidarity and commitment to our most important ally, um, and having the, the pressure of being able to, to do something um, under the Damocles sword of the pressure to also leave. And I think these are the dilemmas that we face in Afghanistan, um, how to reconcile, for instance, a Bundestag that always has to have the freedom to say, no, we're leaving, and the requirements that a military mission or development missions have to have for planning and long-term strategies. And this is why a lot of the things that we built in Afghanistan were there only uh, so long as we were there. And to, of course, also the other, the other questions that we have is how can we build a state while we're also fighting wars? While the conflict is going on, how can you be, uh, how can you be stable? How can you, from the outside, build, uh, build stable structures? I think these are questions that are very difficult, especially for the, for the German tradition of foreign policy, which is focusing heavily on multilateralism, on, is dependent on what allies do, has of course the obligation to protect soldiers, not put them in harm's way. Um, but I would say, I'm afraid that a lesson could be, because that is something that we hear in media when politicians talk about it, and I'm really of course interested in Roderick's point of it, is that, the lesson from Afghanistan, at least in the beginning, in the past month was, oh, our goals were too ambitious, or we like we took a bigger, a too big of a bite uh, that we cannot chew, and we have to be more modest, and we have to maybe maybe smaller uh, operations, and uh, and start from the beginning to think about the exit. My concern, thinking about the future, especially of our engagement beyond Europe, is that. Uh, a, one of the lessons should be that uh, we went with a knife to a gunfight. The, 
investments that the international community made in Afghanistan were too little for the for the ambitious goals. So of course you can make uh, you can downsize your goals, but you could also think about what do you actually need to invest? How many soldiers would you have to send? Is that depending on the ability on the ground, the facts on the ground, or by what's feasible politically? Um, so I think that should not be the lesson from Afghanistan. We shouldn't completely disengage. A second factor, and that's why it's very interesting how the German policy uh, establishment will review what happens in Iraq, but also Mali, obviously, is does it mean that we're getting also more cautious in supporting democratic or transitional states? Or is there a new revived, well, I wouldn't say love, but appreciation for the stable power holder um, that holds like the country together, that rules and at least makes sure that borders are secure, that migrants would stay where they are, and that transnational uh, security issues that we in Europe are actually aware of, smuggling, trafficking, um, all these issues, uh, that these um, that these borders uh, then are are actually contained and, and secured. And this is, I think, something that I'm a bit afraid of when looking to um, to the new government and their as far as we, we talk now, not yet like discovered uh, strategy towards uh, towards the challenges in the South. Thank you. Um, Magdalena, of course, joining us from Jordan, where she is the director of the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation office. And now we're going to go to Alan in Baden-Württemberg, where uh, Roderich Kiesewetter uh, is in his home constituency uh, today. Um, uh, Roderick, I'd like to ask, uh, you know, do you see, uh, how do you see uh, the lessons emerging from Afghanistan? Of course, there will be a longer parliamentary and, um, and other investigative process, but um, do you see the danger of overlearning the lessons uh, of the past uh, here? Or um, how, where do you see the balance as, uh, uh, as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and someone with uh, decades of experience in security policy? And thank you for the excellent question, Jeff. And I'm also happy to see Magdalena here. And good luck in Jordan and all the best for you as well. And thank you also for the interest uh, of the audience. Yeah. Um, well, as a parliamentarian and a former officer who has been quite frequently in Afghanistan and in several deployments abroad, also on the Balkans, I, s I would also have a close look to the reason why are we in Afghanistan? Where, well, what was the reason to deploy troops? And 9-11 created also a bad conscience in German politics because the American secret services gave us a warning already in 2000 that there might be some terrorists planning an attack from Germany. So our own security architecture did not detect the presence of terrorists who prepared 9-11 from Hamburg. And this was one of the reasons that Germany was engaged militarily in, in uh, the early, from the beginning uh, of this deployment. And we took over responsibility in two Petersburg events, one in 2001 and the other in 2011. And we gave a promise, not only as Germany, we gave a promise as international community to stay in Afghanistan at least until 2024, to develop Afghanistan to a normal, less developed country. And we broke this. Um, it was broken by Trump. And unfortunately, Biden pursued this then immediately when he took over office, probably not on purpose, but by trying to, to get things uh, from the table. So, and then the German commitment, and therefore overruling it or over uh, exaggerating it, the German commitment was in Afghanistan to create a peaceful environment and that German troops are engaged in a peaceful environment. But this was wicked, this was wrong. And the reason was, and this is also very important, I believe, for the assessment of our engagement, that we came to northern Afghanistan by fortune, by an accident, because the Brits couldn't finance Maza i Sharif any longer and asked Germany to take over, the, to finance the um, pilgrimage airport in Maza i Sharif. It costed, at that time, it cost 20, uh, billion, uh, 20 million euros 
and we saw the north is peaceful, so we went to the north. If not, our troops were to be deployed to Helmand and Kandahar, where the Netherlands, the Canadians, and also uh, the Brits had thousands of killed in action. So we created by the beginning a wrong narrative for a peaceful build-up. And having said that, there is also the reason for, for our wrong perception of this Afghanistan engagement. And I hope that the enquete commission in the enquete uh, committee in the, uh, outside the parliament will take this up. Inside the parliament, we unfortunately only look to the last months of the deployment, uh, where were the, sig the signals, the sensors uh, that uh, Afghanistan uh, will be held by the Taliban, especially that Kabul might fall in their hands peacefully, which was true. So um, my, I believe, I strongly believe that we Germans have to reconsider our narrative and we should not engage troops for the sake of our allies, but we should engage troops for the sake of our national interests, which are shared by the allies. But we cannot pronounce and announce um, strategic solidarity without having clear military and security interests in the region. And this goes also with Mali, this goes with the Western Balkans, this goes with our deployment of the vessel in the Indo-Pacific. So if we deploy troops, this must uh, coincide, uh, must be in a coherent manner with our national interests. And the result is that we need, and the new government have, has mentioned it in the coalition treaty, we need a national security strategy. Believe me, dear audience, we don't have a national security strategy. We even do not have a national security council. So what we need is to enhance our federal security council to enable it for a, for a better um, advice, for creating advice for our government. It must be a comprehensive council and we should develop a national security strategy. Otherwise, we cannot cope. We cannot cope with uh, the challenges we have in Europe and we cannot cope with the challenges uh, we are urged from Russia uh, in Ukraine and in Belarus and so on. This as a brief answer, but you see I'm also emotionally touched because there were really severe mistakes which were not debated, neither in the parliament nor in the public. Um, they come up slowly, but they will come up with an immense power because they need to be debated. Very important points you've raised, Roderich, and I think we will come to the national security strategy uh, question in a minute, but I want to pause um, and, and dwell on, on one uh, issue that you've raised, which is the other German uh, military engagements, and also connect it to something that uh, Magdalena said as well. She described Afghanistan as kind of existing um, in parallel to the uh, European security situation, uh, in particular, uh, provoked most recently by Russia. Um, do you see it similarly? Do you see lessons from Afghanistan for, for Germany's core security interests in the Euro-Atlantic space? Um, uh, and, and if so, how do you see those influencing each other? Or is this really a question of, uh, of uh, missions of, of choice, so to speak, um, uh, further from Germany's shores, whereas the, uh, the core security interests are on the European continent? Hmm. Yeah, excellent question. One of the key lessons we or identified lessons, I would like to say, is that we need to evaluate our missions abroad. We always avoided, we started in 2011 with a, with a smart but too small evaluation of the operation. It stopped then 2016 due to some uh, national security interests. It wasn't made public any longer. But what we need is evaluation. And we need a comprehensive evaluation to combine military engagement and also uh, development agencies engagement. And also not only for strategic reasons, but also for resources question and for the question of success. How successful are we? And I must also make a plea to, to us uh, members of parliament we have only signed and uh, voted for the every year 
for uh, for the um, request of the government to prolong the Afghanistan engagement. And all questions about evaluation or all questions about the level of ambition um, were a little bit mitigated and they never were debated. So we had trust in the government, but we also debated it in the parliament, but you could exchange the speeches from 11, 12, 16, 18, uh, similar speeches. So there was no strategic debate. This is the second uh, lesson learned we need. As we have a budget week in the parliament, we need a kind of security policy week in the parliament to debate our engagement comprehensively. And the third uh, is that if we go abroad, we must equip our soldiers with the best equipment possible and with so much leeway that they grant the success of the engagement. The terms of reference, uh, the caveats we had, they were sometimes so paralyzing. Give me an example. I'll give you an example. For example, the support of the 207 and 206 Anacor in the north with our uh, military uh, liaison teams and, and uh, training teams. These teams were not allowed to accompany the corps, the battalions, the uh, squads, and, and uh, uh, companies into war. So we trained them, but when it came uh, to war fighting, we should abstain due, due to the military uh, limits we had from the parliament and from the government. So if we go into an area, be it Mali or be it elsewhere, we must equip them also with a rule of law which provides them with a scope where they create trust. But how will you create trust from the partner you train if you are not allowed to accompany him in war fighting? This is, seems to be very practical nitty gritty, but it isn't because amongst soldiers of any troops, you need comradeship, fellowship, you need obedience, or obedient, or to be obedient to, to the law and to the, to the orders, and you need trust. And this trust needs also that you share the weaknesses and also the strength of the immediate and imminent situations. And we didn't do that. And this is also a very important consequence. If Germany wants to support our partners, we need to provide our troops with the best possible, not only the equipment, but also with the terms of references. So let me um, expand the aperture um, a bit uh, with you, Roderick, and then we'll come to you, Magdalena, uh, for your views as well. And that is, you, you, it seems that, you've wel that you welcome the government's commitment to, um, to write uh, and publish a national security strategy. Um, uh, you seemed, uh, you, called, you called for it to be uh, not just a document, but also uh, the subject of debate. Um, so, uh, if you if you look uh, forward to the principles that should be in it, you've mentioned that uh, German security engagement should be driven by German interests and not simply uh, by reflexive solidarity. Are there other principles that you see that uh, that need to be uh, part of um, the uh, the national security strategy? Um, uh, you you've also spoken about the need to uh, enable and equip German forces, but. If you, if you were to spell out uh, the, the key uh, principles, how would they appear to you, Rotary? Yeah, um, there are two key paradigms, I believe. The first is any engagement must strengthen or should at least not weaken European cohesion. So Germany is a kind of a, a uh, pillar for the interests of the Eastern European countries who feel threatened by Russia and the Southern European countries who are threatened by migration. And both do not communicate with each other. And this is a key function for Germany to combine the different threats and menaces and interests. The second key paradigm is do not weaken transatlantic solidarity and transatlantic cooperation. For example, nuclear sharing, we need a common space of shared security. And one of the fostering principles is nuclear sharing that the Americans will be present in Europe, 
not only by economics, but also by military engagement and military obligations. And on the other side, we Europeans need to offer a credible burden sharing. So these two key paradigms, European cohesion, combined with transatlantic security and a credible mutual burden sharing, especially from the European side, Americans share the burden, we need to show that we also are able to invest and engage in our key neighborhood. With this, we have, I believe, a very good uh, starting point to develop this strategy. And this should not only focus on climate change and climate foreign policy and the Green Deal of European Union, this is also important because it's a question of resources and a question of, uh, I believe, also uh, a, a European voice in, in fighting the, the climate change. But we also need a clear a conviction to a, a also to, to war fighting security to avoid war. For example, last the remark in this context, if we were able to provide Ukraine with certain weapons, might be defensive weapons, then in the calculation of Russia, it is much more difficult to press Ukraine than with the expression of, we will never due to our history provide Ukraine with weapons. If in the past, in the late thirties, France, Great Britain and the United States would have provided the Czech Republic and Poland with weapons so that the Pol Polish Ulans did not fight against German tanks with lances. It would have been uh, probably in the calculation of Hitler, uh, very difficult to attack Poland. And therefore we should not take our history as an argument against the support of countries in our neighborhood. We should learn from that. Thank you. Um, Magdalena, let me turn back to you and, uh, and uh, ask for your uh, thoughts and reflections on uh, how, how this experience fits into the national security uh, strategy in, in a more broad sense. Mm, I think I, I agree with most of the points uh, that Rotary said, although I would uh, maybe contradict just a little bit by saying that uh, it was obviously in the German national security interest to join uh, or at least support uh, the US after 9-11. And I think that is of course in our approach and German foreign policy continues. And that's probably also what you mentioned to be like very strongly embedded also in the narrative in multilateralism. Um, so not going alone, not like, developing a national strategy, but the national strategy would immediately also have to be European and transatlantic and often that's difficult uh, to achieve. But I think these would be like the, um, maybe the, the poles uh, that a national security process would also have to, um, have to face. That the moment we discuss about Germany's own interest and Germany's own and then if I understood also really right, like more sincere commitment, if this is really what we want, then we would plan differently uh, and put the resources behind it. Whereas in contrast, if we do something out of solidarity or to like send a signal, uh, we would also not think through it uh, strategically. And then we would not be happy with the results. But obviously um, being in an alliance, being uh, together with others is, some, is like not only a reflex, but I think also a survival strategy of Germany that will certainly influence this. And um, I think that's a dilemma because it often leads to, I wouldn't call it irresponsibility, but um, to a behavior of also German politicians to hide behind uh, like multilateral, um, to multilateral um, agreements and then fail to explain um, actually the reasoning and the strategies, especially to a German audience that then often is confused or worse, not even interested. So I think uh, how to deal with the, the multilateralism versus or in uh, maybe a more har harmonized way uh, with our national interests or what are we even defined by it? I think that would be key. One thing with the hindsight of having the experience in Afghanistan and also obviously other theaters and areas we might go to or we are even there and might stay for a while is how to find the balance between this 
like multilateralism and commitment to our like previous and mostly Western alliance and how to meaningfully um, make this compatible with local partners and local alliances, their needs, um, obviously in capacity building, but also in supporting them in uh, building straight state and even democratic structures. I think there is often, um, well, at least a conflict between what might look good in like NATO headquarters or EU headquarters and what makes sense, even what are the, the strategic goals of our policies. But when you look to the local side of, uh, of this engagement and partnerships, there are much more different interests sometimes at play. Um, and there that can be risky for us when we get drawn into war economies and uh, local partners like our presence and therefore have no interest to solve the conflicts that we try to, to solve. But of course, it can also lead to these mission creep uh, effects that we want to, uh, that we actually want to avoid, that we're going to stay there forever and we're not creating sustainable things. So I think if we have a national security strategy, it would be good if at least has like chapters and like a bit of a localized a structure on different parts of the world and identifying who are the partners there, what are our aims, and how do we plan to achieve them. Mm -hmm. uh, Roderick, you know, you mentioned the uh, the possibility of um, or the way in which providing defensive weapons um, to to Ukraine um, might uh, favorably affect um, the, uh, the the calculations in Moscow. Uh, about whether to um, invade or use force. Um, uh, if I if I take uh, also the point you made about having Germany needing an interest driven or an interest um, uh, defined narrative for the German public about uh, its security engagement, how does that look in the in in the Russia uh, context to you? Um, it, do you see an, a, a need for a stronger invocation and explanation of the German uh, national interest uh, in, in regard to, uh, to Russia right now? Or do you think that is adequately um, being reflected in, uh, in the government's approach? Uh, I see that you follow our domestic discussion. <laughs> um, Germany has no, not a unified attitude towards Russia. We have received about 3 million migrants, uh, German origin, from Russia, Kazakhstan, 3 million about, in the last 30 years. And uh, not all of them are very well integrated and they listen uh, to Russia today and some other uh, in, in uh, Russian native language uh, promulgating uh, broadcasting companies and so on. Second, we have a German nostalgia or romanticism towards Russia, um, not forced by Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt, but uh, for example, from, from Platzek, uh, former chief of the Social Democratic Party, um, who believe that uh, change by trade might be a functional narrative still today, combined with uh, Nord Stream 2 and the behavior of Gerhard Schröder, who left the office and in the same year when he left the office, joined uh, Gazprom services. So this romanticism believes that we could change Russia if we uh, st are stuck in trade and if we uh, communicate uh, via energy politics and so on. This goes back to the 60s. Since the 60s, we have a very reliable energy um, uh, relation with Russia uh, regarding petrol and gas. Nevertheless, there's a rule-based international order and also the so-called Ostpolitik from Willy Brandt was related to human rights and to a strong military defense. And for the time being, there is also inside my party, there are differences between the politicians who are uh, taking care for economics and those who are in the Committee of Foreign Affairs. We have always criticized the way how the Nord Stream 2 project is portrayed as a simple private economic project. It's a geopolitical one and it's against the European Union. So the, the question of how to tackle Russia must be changed into a European focused 
politics because we lost trust not only in Poland, but also in France. And only due to Macron's engagement, we have Nord Stream 2 because Macron asked for the new negotiated uh, treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, a renewed treaty which was uh, founded from uh, Adenauer and de Gaulle and now from Merkel and Macron. This treaty asked Germany to defend France. There is a clause which is stronger than the Article 5 in the NATO treaty. But this was a request from France to acknowledge Nord Stream 2. And we Germans then changed the Nord Stream 2 from a bilateral project to a project where also Poland and Ukraine can get gas which, or uh, at least revenues uh, and transit costs and tariffs for Ukraine. So it's very tricky and it's really difficult and we cannot um, defend this project if we would pursue the traditional way as a purely economic relationship. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got several questions. Let me encourage uh, once again, our viewers to submit your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, and we have already a few. So I would like to, uh, to start, uh, start with those. Um, the first uh, question uh, is, is about um, uh, the U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan um, and what kind of a power vacuum um, that leaves and how that might um, be filled by uh, others, whether it is China, Russia, um, or indeed from South Asia, um, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, Iran. Um, how do you see uh, that changing? And, and more importantly, how significant will that rebalancing um, uh, be? Uh, I'll start with you, Magdalena, uh, and we'll come to Robert. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That's a really good question. I think if we look at it right now and uh, projectively into the next year, we see a total vac vacuum. Um, like the impact on the withdrawal, not only like the the security forces, but also like the economic support, financial support, the collapse of the state. Uh, that is right now the situation we will have until I think the mid of the year, almost a million Afghans who lost their jobs because they were dependent on the international presence. We have a, a hunger catastrophe. Uh, we have thousands who are still trying to leave the country every day and there is no the vacuum is so big that you would probably need like a Taliban capacity times 1000 to even start um, basically piecing the things together. We conducted a couple of uh, studies before the withdrawal, assuming or anticipating a discussion like this, where we looked at a lot of regional players from China, Russia, and others, if someone would be willing to actually step in. Um, at that time when it wasn't uh, completely sure how the withdrawal would uh, go, nobody actually, no neighboring state showed an interest in picking up uh, the pieces, especially not sending military forces. And what we've seen so far from humanitarian pledges, but also from engagement, it also doesn't look like that Russia or China, even like the big guys are trying to step in significantly. There is engagement, but the engagement is to cut it short basically the strategy that China and, uh, and Pakistan, Iran are trying to get is to get the international community, mostly the Western donors back in. Um, that also leads, uh, is I think based on the fact that all neighboring states are aware that instability in Afghanistan is not in their interest, but their stabilization goals are very limited. It is basically secure borders and uh, the ability to arrest terrorists uh, when they want and maybe exploiting some resources. So, so far what we see just as a last uh, point is a strategy of containment by the neighboring states. There is cooperation with the Taliban, but it's merely focused on securing borders, preventing the flow of refugees, preventing the flow of terrorists or drugs in neighboring states and is certainly not going to last long because it does not contrib contribute to any domestic st stabilization in Afghanistan. Rotary, would you like to add anything to that? Only very briefly, I could completely sign what uh, Magdalena just has said. Um, it has damaged also the appearance and reliability of the Western alliance. And it has shown to us Europeans that we are not able to stick to our obligations without the Americans. 
So there is also a plea or a request for own European capacities in this context, not against the United States, but to replace the United States if need be. And as regards humanitarian aid and, and support, yes, there are some agencies present, uh, but we, I believe we need to lift some sanctions uh, for the sake of humanitarian aid and for the promise of the Taliban leadership, who are also under pressure, that they are willing to receive this aid also for women, for children, and that uh, we should have one condition, that children and female students can go back to school and to, to university. Mm -hmm. Um, on the humanitarian uh, question, uh, Magdalena, um, can, would you like to say more about the the options and the the risks of of resuming um, uh, humanitarian uh, support? I think it is like um, yeah, but we're between a rock and a hard place. I think the problem was that we did not have, and that includes, unfortunately, also Europe. Nobody had a strategy for negotiations fail and Taliban are in power. I think the scenarios was, if negotiations fail, the Americans will just stay forever until there is a next chance, but not let uh, the government uh, basically uh, drop. Um, so yes, the humanitarian catastrophe is uh, real, and uh, that is mostly due to the inability to get money and funds into, into the country, but also the exodus that we've seen of aid workers and also their staff. Um, the risk that we have now is that even humanitarian aid is politicized against the background that it's also seen as a defeat supporting the, the Taliban regime. Roderick made a good point and said, I mean, also the Taliban are accountable somewhat uh, to the constituencies and they have to like deliver if they don't want to be the next uh, to be thrown out. But how do you sell to a Western audience, Western taxpayers, that after 20 years of fighting the Taliban, you are now basically rewarding them with money. So that is very difficult, but I think abstaining from the discussion, avoiding it costs lives on the ground. And even the, the discussion about women and universities in the scenarios where Afghans have to sell like houses, furniture, organs, and children, uh, thinking about attending a university is a luxury. And there are no teachers uh, and no money to pay for universities either way. So I think definitely humanitarian aid has to be resumed. The sanction against the Taliban have to be at least adjusted because they were built when the Taliban were the insurgencies. They do not fit the reality that the Taliban are now uh, ruling the country. And um, yes, I mean, beyond that, the, the problem is that with humanitarian aid alone, we will not solve the problem of Afghanistan. So it will then be a failed state that where people might not starve on the street, but all the government services, they have to be financed as well. So that means we also have to work towards an agreement with the Taliban at the end of the day, they would allow also to move from humanitarian aid to development aid and being it very strictly conditioned and being it very basic, but uh, thinking for the next 20 years of only humanitarian aid will not solve any problems in the country. Thank you. Um, uh, I wanna come back to a point that uh, Roderick made, and that is about the, the reliability or the perceived reliability of European um, uh, countries and of uh, uh, perhaps uh, the European Union uh, itself. And, what uh, how do you how would you connect um the the withdrawal for example um uh, from afghanistan um to to the question of of reliability when you transpose it to the ukraine uh, context um you know the german foreign minister was just in in kiev um this week uh, the american secretary of state is there now um there there will be uh, no doubt, further diplomatic engagements at a high level. Um, Roderick, where do you see the uh, the level of European reliability and credibility uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with the security uh, threat posed uh, by Russia's military buildup around Ukraine? It's really a very difficult question because Ukraine is not an ally 
is not a member of the European Union, but Ukraine is a member of the OSCE. And one way out could be to revigorate, to, to re encourage, and to enable the OSCE, but you need then Russia also. Um, Ukraine is not a role model so far for Russia or for Eastern European countries. We have neglected, uh, or to put it in other words, the European Union handled Ukraine until 2014 with a kind of checklist mentality. But they didn't increase pressure on corrupt elites and they did not um, combine assistance with uh, obligations or with uh, fulfillments of obligations from the Ukrainian side. And this hollowed out the political system and made it quite easy for Russian friendly, uh, for a Russian friendly opposition and for Russia itself. So if we, as Europeans, as the European Union, take care for countries, we need to look for our basic principles. This is good governance. This is fu a functioning taxation system. And this is fight against organized crime and corruption. Otherwise, our engagement would uh, not be focused. It would be inefficient and it would not be credible because then the elites would try to, to gain more money or more influence. So this was one of the key mistakes, but this should not be the, the argument to sacrifice Ukraine. And therefore the diplomacy was, I, I would like to, to underline that Annalena Baerbock made an excellent visit to Ukraine and also to Lavrov. So she was quite clear. She was not too friendly towards Russia. And she tried to, to find, out ways, uh, find out ways, for example, the energy question or not something like that. But it was not easy for her in this diplomacy because Scholz was outspoken against um, uh, not to use Nord Stream 2 as a sanctionary system. And other parties also, including uh, Merz, the incoming chief of our party, ruled out the SWIFT system to be part of the of, of a sanctionary system. So um, we need to name and blame the hybrid actions of Russia. And what we need is to speak with a unified voice. And it is not helpful when, when the German, uh, as the German government, ruled out issues without having negotiated them with our European partners. So there, is, there are some deficiencies, but all in all, I believe that this diplomacy by, by Blinken, by Baerbock and others will be successful. So it raises the level of ambition and it raises also the necessity for Russia to, to spring over these barriers. So probably the price tech is, is uh, rising now for Russia. Let me ask each of you a different uh, credibility question. And that is in August, September, 2021, um, especially as the United States accelerated its uh, withdrawal um, and, uh, and indeed as the uh, Afghan uh, government uh, collapsed, um, there was a lot of discussion, especially in the United States about um, the effect this would have on American credibility, that, uh, that, that the United States would be perceived as um, a, um, a weak uh, ally or partner, and one that doesn't uh, stand up to defend um, uh, countries that have aligned itself themselves with, uh, with Washington. Um, have those uh, concerns been uh, basically overtaken uh, by the American engagement on, uh, on the uh, Russia-Ukraine situation? Uh, in other words, have those doubts, uh, doubts existed? Um, do you believe they've been erased uh, over the last uh, several weeks and months of, of intense European-focused diplomacy? Um, Roderick, I'll start with you and then go to Michael. This is a very tricky question. Why? We have experienced in the last week that uh, Russia and the US negotiated about Europe and Europe was not at the table. And this is really a mess for uh, the European community, for Borrell, for von der Leyen, 
and also for Macron and for Scholz as the key figures of European leadership, also Draghi also. So can I see? Sorry, Robert, yeah, sure. you say Europe wasn't at the table. Do you mean the European Union? Um, because there were consultations in various formats, um, uh, which included some or all European countries like the OSCE. Yes, but when Putin and Biden sit together and Putin is uh, raising the, the, or is demanding that NATO should withdraw to an area prior to 1997 mm -hmm. and that Ukraine should be a kind of Finland. And in the meantime, Finland and Sweden are trying to, to become or are, are considering to become NATO members. This is a little bit ironic or cynic. So it, I'm, so I'm grateful to, to Biden that he said this will not happen, not at all. But if there was a Trump, he never would have mentioned Europe in this way as Biden did. So we have to be grateful to Biden, but we need to be nervous that the European Union has not a key role in this context, in this negotiation. So we need a triangle and the European Union must make up its mind and sit at the negotiation table. Otherwise, Putin will exploit the situation. Mm -hmm. Magdalena. Yeah, I mean, going back to like the, let's say the painful uh, experiences in the last year, I think there was a lot of like hurt emotions, uh, both from the way that uh, the US envoy Khalizad basically like flew in European capitals, just gave debriefings and disappeared. And there was no real consultation uh, with allies uh, in how to leave Afghanistan. There was I would say a miscalculation on behalf of uh, the German policy or a lot of German policymakers on Biden's attention. So they assumed, oh, he's the good guy and he will like stay in Afghanistan without having reading, having read all his statements before that he was very determined to leave. And then I think it was quite remarkable coming back to the very first question that you had that during the, the evacuation, when it became clear to also Germans that we wouldn't be able to evacuate without the support of the US or it would basically determine by the US how many planes would we get into that airport. There was a, a renewed discussion about we need European defense capability so the next time we can evacuate ourselves. Um, but already at that point, I think in September, October, it became clear that yes, there are hurt feelings. I think on Afghanistan will become, will stay like a difficult topic, uh, but there are, and that's the reason why it was so easy, I would say, for Biden to move on from Afghanistan. There is a consensus that there are other areas, theaters that are more important, so to say, that's climate change, that's China, and that is Russia. I share uh, what Rotary said about the irritation that certainly wasn't US and Taliban negotiating without the government, um, because the EU wasn't uh, really present in the Ukraine crisis from the beginning. It was often like the big EU member states uh, that took the role of mediators on, but that it would be a Russian US negotiation over what's between them. I would say that at least from like the public that like Blinken traveled to Berlin or also to Kiev, that Anna Baerbock went to Washington, that at least from the frequency of meetings um, and the rhetoric that I mean, I'm not sure if that's intentional to like make good on what happened on Afghanistan, but I think the strategy, at least rhetorically and what's being communicated, it is, I think, trying to, to strike the balance between Russia being quite open about wanting to discuss with like the biggest player in the room, wanting to discuss this with the US prior to, to engaging the Europeans and the US responsibilities to, of course, bring the Europeans on board because I think the president was also quite clear that he has no intention of sending U.S. troops uh, to Ukraine. Uh, so there has to be cooperation with, uh, with Europe. But yeah, I think there are some sensitivities that also have to be taken into consideration by the U.S. government. Okay. Um, the last question I'm going to uh, give, po pose to you is about uh, a, a topic each of you has referred to, um, but we haven't uh, dwelt on. And that is um, uh, Germany's, uh, if we think about the harder edge of, uh, uh, of security, Germany's military capabilities. Um, and I'd like to, to hear your thoughts on what, 
um, if we're talking about lessons, uh, not only from Afghanistan, but for Germany's international engagement, um, do you have um, particular um, ideas uh, that you consider most important for where Germany should focus its uh, capability uh, development and its uh, ability to act uh, in an international security context, um, taking lessons perhaps from Afghanistan, as you just mentioned, Magdalena, um, but also from the situation uh, in Europe and indeed other Germany's other uh, foreign um, uh, military deployments. I'll start Magdalena with you and then I'll give Rotary the last word. As I'm not an expert on defense spending or like a 2% uh, debate, maybe, let me start the other way around. I think when we look at Afghanistan, I don't think it was a problem of Germany's military capabilities or lack thereof, but uh, it was the way we used what we put in the in the theater, like uh, Roderick also said regarding the caveats. And if we're dependent on, for instance, uh, the critical uh, capacities by the US to, for instance, evacuate uh, soldiers, then we have to make even more sure that we are on the table and that we are involved in discussions that would make it very difficult for us if we don't want to bring these capabilities uh, to, um, to the field. Um, so I think it is much more the reluctance of Germany to actually put money where the mouth is and being really clear about preferences. Um, then it is what is actually in the hardware. Um, but obviously it is, uh, yeah, it's again like a, a dilemma because if Germany does not develop a strategy discussion and being open about what are the priorities and what do we want to achieve, it will be very difficult to convince policymakers, but even their constituencies that more is actually needed because there is the reluctance of, uh, of the German public towards also among the taxpayers to just procure uh, basically, um, yeah, to procure weapons and systems without defining what's the purpose of it. So um, I fully agree that Germany has to be more assertive in uh, leading a responsible strat like strategy, strategic discussion, um, but the policy discussion should become well, the primate or should stay the primate before uh, we talk about the technical capacities that are needed. Otherwise, uh, we also create an image of capability that we are not using when we're not generate the support among the public and policymakers for it. Roderick, you've talked about the principles that should, uh, that should underlie German uh, policy and how those uh, should be reflected in the, the national security strategy. And then the next thing to come then is, what, uh, what means and instruments uh, Germany needs to have. Um, uh, your thoughts? First of all, marvelous what Magdalena just has said and only some additional thoughts. Um, first of all, in Germany, the public and also we parliamentarians must be aware that armed forces are a tool of politics and not the purpose on its own. And because they are a purpose, uh, they, they are a tool they need to be well equipped and the, the political leadership needs an idea about their armed forces. Um, second, I believe we would have more bang for the buck, as some people say, if we would invest more in standardization and interoperability with our European neighbors and the key technical lead nation, the United States. The question of signal, um, uh, um, or signal equipment, yeah, uh, IT infrastructure, use of artificial intelligence, and uh, the standardization of European armies. We have about 170 different weapon types in uh, only for the ground forces. The American forces have about 12 or 15, and we need to shrink this variety down to a small digital number to 20, 25, but then enable our defense industry to produce best possible products. And for Germany, we have a lot of problems with our defense industry and armaments export. I believe that if we take care for the modernization of our Eastern European partners, we would achieve two issues. First of all, uh, 
our defense industry would have a chance to survive, which is not very certain. And second, we would create more reliability and trust amongst the European neighbors. And we would show to the Americans that we are able to provide security also by, by hardware uh, to our neighbors in a credible way. I believe these all together, in addition to that, what uh, Magdalena has said, would create a good uh, package for, uh, for the German armed forces. Okay. Um, so uh, we've we've uh, traversed uh, quite some distance uh, today. Uh, we've we've gone from the traumatic um, uh, and uh, and sort of su surprisingly quick uh, withdrawal and collapse uh, of the government in Afghanistan um, uh, through the uh, German military deployments in places like the Western Balkans uh, and uh, Mali and the Sahel, uh, as well as the current uh, crisis in Europe. And uh, I want to I want to thank Magdalena Kirchner and Rotary Kiesewetter for uh, you know, showing us uh, the, the insights that uh, have made this journey possible um, and giving us uh, ideas that we will I think all be hearing more about as uh, as Germany grapples with its experience in Afghanistan um, and also as it defines its security goals um, for. The remainder of this legislative term, at least, in a national security strategy. So, um, having covered that ground and having uh, participants from uh, from uh, Jordan, from from Baden-Württemberg, uh, and from all of you all around the world, um, I want to thank you, um, and I want to thank our uh, the German Marshall Fund of the United States for uh, support, which has helped to make this uh, event possible. By the way. And I wanna uh, look forward to seeing uh, all of you again at the next event uh, of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Thanks Magdalena, thanks Roderich and a good day to, uh, to everyone. Thank you.